She is the author of several books and a general editor of the Call to Holiness series. She's a professor of religious studies at Fairfield University, just down the road here. And she lectures widely on Christian tradition, especially medieval mysticism, grace, the Holy Spirit, and contemporary lay spirituality. Yay. She's written Holy Power, Holy Presence, Medieval Metaphors of the Holy Spirit, and most recently, a book she's going to tell you a little bit more about, Accidental Theologians. When I was looking for a research on introducing her tonight, be careful what you put on the web, so there was an answer to an interview she'd given. If you could invite any four people in history to dinner, who would they be and what would you have to eat? <laughs> I'm going to leave some of the answers blank for you, but I will tell you that the dinner was Chilean, Chilean sea bass, and Julian of Norwich and Catherine of Siena were on the list. We may ask her later about the other two. Please join me in welcoming our guest tonight, Elizabeth Dreyer. Thanks, Katie. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Um, I would like to thank Father Boulogne and your community for inviting me um, to join you this evening on this cold, blustery day. Um, I said I, we were debating all day whether to have this or not, and I said I probably wouldn't go out on a night like tonight <laughs> to hear somebody talk about women theologians, but here we are, so this is great. Um, so, I have two questions to begin. How many of you have heard the phrase doctors of the church? <laughs> okay. How many of you, for how many of you is this a really important title? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Four. Okay. Um, the occasion for writing this book was the naming of the fourth woman doctor of the church, Hildegard of Bingen last October, and um, as all of you know here, we have a lot of women theologians now, um, happily, um, especially in the West, where women have an opportunity to be professional theologians with credentials, etc. And I'll talk a little bit about how I think um, women theologians from the past have opened the door to a broader understanding of a lot of things, including doctor of the church, what that means, including what theologian means, um, an opening category of gender, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm very happy that we have so many women theologians now, and happy that we are um, discovering and naming women theologians from the distant past. Um, I'm basically a medievalist, and so the challenge of this book and I, if you're interested, can talk a little bit about that, was Therese of Lisieux. Um, the four women doctors of the church are Catherine of Siena, Teresa of Avila, Therese of Lisieux, and now Hildegard of Bingen, um, who happened to live in a, quote, German neighborhood of the former pontiff, which is probably the largest reason behind her being named a saint and being named a doctor of the church. Um, all, I guess all theology and politics is local, and it, it, it applies to the church as well. So I'd like to begin with a lament, um, and that, I think while I won't end with a lament, I'll end with a celebration, that it's important to keep before us the loss of uh, women's work and women's presence throughout history. And it, it is a tragic, tragic loss. So every day I weep over the loss. Um, and uh, no one is unscathed in terms of the loss. It, um, women for almost all of history continuing to the present were not considered important enough to be encouraged um, to write, to compose, to write poetry and symphonies and bridges and buildings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the loss to the world of these poems not written, the symphonies not composed, and theology not expressed is a great loss. And I'm happy that we're beginning to correct that. And um, because of the absence of women, um, it's quite imperative, I feel, that we um, include women and that, that the church's theology 
um, and the world need women theologians, both in the formal and the informal sense, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, women doctors of the church make up a whopping 12%. There are 35 doctors of the church, and four of them are women. And the primary goal for writing the book um, was to present um, their theologies, but it was very clear to me this was, this was not supposed to be a magnum opus. It's a, it's a book for ordinary people, for lay theologians. And um, so I ended up choosing one theological theme for each w woman. So each woman has a Christology, a doctrine of the Trinity, a moral theology, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that was just too much to get into this little book. So I ended up um, reflecting on uh, their corpus as a whole and um, choosing a topic for each of the women. And I began, I did the book uh, chronologically, so I begin with Hildegard, who's 12th century, even though she was the last woman to be named a doctor of the church. So I did uh, the chapter on Hildegard. I spoke about her theology of the Holy Spirit. Um, Catherine of Siena, I chose to talk about her theology of incarnation. Teresa of Avila, I chose to talk about her Christian anthropology, and I'll talk a little bit about that as one of the examples later. And then Therese of Lisieux, I chose her theology of the cross. And she was the challenge. I always say I go through the 16th century and then don't ask me any questions. So in the 17th century, I fall off a cliff in terms of, um, so the present and how the past can speak to the present. And I was never uh, drawn. How many in this room are, were, were never drawn or are not drawn to Therese of Lisieux? So a lot of, OK, so a couple people. Um, for all kinds of reasons. And the literature on her is very blunt about uh, her style. And um, if, you're, if you read it at face value, uh, it's saccharine, it can be, you know, it's sort of, she's everything you don't want to be as a 21st century woman theologian on, on the surface. But I went in, um, I'm old enough to, re I think, go in with a really open mind, and it, it was a lot of work to deal with her corpus. And the second goal of the book was to contextualize these, and this is one thing that I try to do as an historian that I think most people are not equipped to do who write books on theology or spirituality for a wider public. And that is to situate these women in the world they lived in so that you, to help people see they thought this way and they said this and they had this Christology or this theology of the Holy Spirit for these reasons. These are the audiences they're addressing. These are the battles that they are fighting. Um, these are the things that shape who they are. Um, so the book is very historical, and some people I've heard you know, find that challenging. They're not used to learning about um, 19th century French Catholic piety, which shaped Therese so, so profoundly um, in terms of who she was. And uh, I discovered um, you know, this core, and I was in conversation with Stephen Payne, who's a Carmelite specialist um, who's now in Africa, thank God for email. Um, so you can have communication all over the world. And he commented, too, he was very sympathetic to the difficulty that many modern women and men have with her. But he also commented on, since her death, the, the, the terrible uses to which she has been put. So that's another question I don't address in the book. How is, are these women put to uses that might, you know, we might raise questions about? Um, but that people who take the time to grapple with her come out where I came out, which was that beneath all that saccharine, um, very distasteful kind of understanding of church in terms of where she was in France in the 19th century, there's this rock uh, of holiness. And especially of Therese and of Teresa of Avila, I feel uh, like both of them overturned major, major pieces of their social structure, which doesn't happen very often. I mean, most of us are too close to where we live to see the falsity of it. And both of them, Therese in the last 18 months of her life, so it was very compact in terms of her awareness of realizing 
um, that the God she grew up with, the God she was given by the Catholic Church in France and her family in 19th century France, was really not the true God that she eventually met and was able to write about. And those of you who know Teresa, uh, she it came from a Jewish family. And we didn't find this out until 1947. And the irony of this is that everyone around Teresa had to have known that she came from a Jewish family. So her family was persecuted for recidivism, for you know, practicing Jewish customs after they were forced to become Christians. And she takes that idea of um, pedigree, of family pedigree, and in, in Spain in the 16th century, you were no one unless you knew where you came from, you, you, your family roots. And you could purchase, if you were a wealthy family like Teresa's, you could purchase a certificate that attested to the fact that you were pure blood Spanish Christian. Because if you weren't pure blood Spanish Christian, you were denied access to lots of professions, to lots of opportunities in society. And so in her castle, Teresa, at the, at the beginning, she says to the sisters, isn't it a shame that you don't know who you are? And I didn't realize the import of that one line, because knowing who you were in Spain was everything. But it meant power, it meant prestige, it meant money. And so she says, isn't it too bad you don't know who you are? Only what she meant was that you're made in the image and likeness of God. That was her sadness that we don't know who we are in that sense. And I'm going to say a couple of things about her anthropology, which I think dovetails your homily um, amazingly in terms of what she's communicating to the reader, to her reader, about who they are. Um, just a little couple words about Doctor of the Church. The term itself came into use between 400 and 600, give or take. Um, and it was associated with illustrious patristic male theologian leaders. And originally, they, we, they started with four from the West, uh, Ambrose, Augustine, Gregory, and Jerome. And then it was like, uh-oh, we have four Western fathers of the church, doctors of the church, we better, we better have four Eastern doctors of the church. And so Basil, Gregory Nazianz, and John Chrysostom, and Athanasius. So that was the, the, the canon of doctors of the church. Papal recognition of the title was first given by Boniface VIII in 1298. And there's a strong, um, in the early part, of, a strong liturgical element to this. So it's part of the liturgy. You celebrate a doctor of the church, which brings it down from the ivory tower a little bit. It's about holiness. It's about the community of faith and how we are together. Uh, then the list was very fluid in terms of who was on the list into the Middle Ages. And then in the 16th century, names started to be added. And, people very familiar to you. In 1567, Thomas Aquinas was named a doctor of the church. In 1588, Bonaventure was named a doctor of the church. Um, and in 1720, Anselm was named a doctor of the church. So as later figures in history became doctors of the church, one of the, criterion, one of the criteria for being a doctor of the church was antiquity. And as that changed to people in the Middle Ages that were not just in the early church, um, so that um, requirement was dropped. And then in 1970, Teresa and Catherine are, are named. And someone, I did a lot of radio interviews, and someone um, said, you know, what, what, was, what, what, was, what was my feeling about the, the naming of Teresa and Catherine um, in, in 1970? And I said, it, it just really took a long time. <laughs> um, it, with this whole history from the very beginning of time. So the criteria for being a doctor of the church also have been fluid. So they have changed and morphed a little bit. Um, and so antiquity was dropped. Orthodoxy, obviously, that they were legitimate, not heterodox. Holiness was always a quality. Um, and then named by the church, so that the church would come in and name this person. What, the way I, I talk about this generally is that they are people who have um, contributed to the life of the body of Christ theologically in a significant way over a long period of time. So that it's a gift that keeps on giving in terms of their theological thought shaping the church. 
And then, of course, Vatican II um, opened a lot of our understanding in terms of the charisms of the Holy Spirit and the entire community, the entire people of God. And uh, we have now more aware that it's not just intellectual work, but that it's the work of the whole person. And that's one of the, I'll end with a couple of um, qualities or things that I think are important in the work of these women for us today. So your affections, your feelings, um, your daily life, the, the, it's a much broader understanding of what goes into being a doctor of the church. Um, I think in most cases there's a degree of originality, and I, I, I'm going to talk about a little bit about why I find the women so original. And of course the early church is original. Um, those of you who have studied theology, you know, your first exposure to the patristic church that you never knew about before, I call it the tryout church, the, the first four or five hundred years, because there was no doctrine set. There was no, you know, the biblical canon was still in flux. So everybody's trying to figure out who are we, what should we say, how do we talk about this, and there's, you know, Origen is this creative genius, and he gets later condemned because he was in the tryout church, and he wasn't, he, 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 his positions weren't some of the positions that ended up being the positions that the church took. So it's a, it's a dynamic, exciting period, and um, so it, that's the anchor uh, of, I think, the, the doctor of the church idea in this wonderful early, early period. There was some discussion about, when, especially when Teresa of Lisieux was named, there was a, quite a bit of opposition. And um, one of the criteria was that you had a body of work. And that's definitely true if you know the work of Catherine or Teresa or Hildegard. They have a body, of the, a significant body of theological work. Um, Therese, not so much. So there, was, there were questions raised. What are we doing to this title, Doctor of the Church, if we include Therese? And Therese was, uh, didn't like school. She said books were in her, you know, absolutely blocked her way to God. I mean, she, she was not, you know, the, the, the image of the Thomas Aquinas doing summas and, and Bonaventure. Uh, so one of the questions was, if we make Therese a Doctor of the Church, do we diminish the title, and should we then name every saint? So every person that's named a saint, the, the, a holy one by the church, should we give that title to everybody if we give it to, 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 to Therese? Ignatius of Loyola, for example, is not a doctor of the church, um, which may surprise people, and, and there are others as well. Uh, so anyway, history is messy, and the reasons for things happening or not happening you have to be tracked down. Uh, I want to say a couple of things about what theology is, and this is all leading into how I think these women are very important for theology today. Um, theology and what we call today spirituality, spirituality is a, a recent term, and what we call these two things, spirituality and theology, were, were never uh, distinguished, on, uh, really until almost the first millennia and a half, millennium and a half of Christianity. So in the early period and throughout the, through the Middle Ages, to, to be a theologian was to be a saint. The point of doing theology was to become holy and to help other people become holy. The very act of doing theology was considered a spiritual practice. So there, if, if you had talked to people in the early church or in the Middle Ages about studying God in a quote, oh, quote unquote objective, theological way, they would not have known what you were talking about. And um, a couple of people trace the beginning of this, sep of this separation between lived daily faith experience and the organized reflection on that that we call theology. Uh, you have Bernard and Abelard in the 12th century. So while both of them, and Thomas Aquinas and Anselm, all did both, so the split happens <clears throat> after <clears throat> these individuals, but you have seeds of it. Abelard's sick at Nong, he wants to look at these texts and line up all the contradictions and analyze it in a very rational way. And Bernard is the monastic, Lexio Divina. You just read the scriptures, you pray about them, you don't analyze them, you don't take them apart. You certainly don't line up, as you know, Origen did even in the early church, you know, to find contradictions or differences in translations. 
Um, so I think there was a beginning of this tension even in the 12th century. And then Bonaventure and Aquinas and Anselm both wrote serious, serious academic theology and also the Pange Lingua. And Anselm's prayers are among the most beautiful, moving, affective expressions <clears throat> of praise of God. In the 14th century, reason starts its ascendancy in terms of being valued. And for good and bad reasons, and we weren't there, so we can't exactly throw stones because we weren't, we weren't there in terms of why these decisions were made. But instead of just having theology, separate disciplines began to develop. And Trent reinforced that. <clears throat> so you had what we would call systematic theology, high theology, pure theology. Then you had ascetic theology, mystical theology, moral theology, and all of those were studied as separate disciplines. And it was a long time before we woke up to this bifurcation and we're still working on getting it together. Some um, scholars suggest that spirituality is a temporary uh, entity, uh, that language. That um, the reason spirituality emerged with such force was that theology wasn't doing its job. It wasn't inclusive enough. It wasn't holistic enough. And so the community has to account for this, uh, these other parts of ourselves besides just intellectual reflection. Um, so I don't know where you would stand on that, whether I think it'll be a long time before spirituality goes away. And there are arguments, good arguments on both sides. And these women are, are people who held them together. And that's why I think in one way they, they can be very valuable to us. So we're trying to fix the breach still. Um, the women themselves, let me say a few things about them. Uh, women were not expected, not allowed, to um, preach or teach about God in public. There was um, much more understanding and flexibility if women wrote as most of the women did for the sisters in their own convent or for a local, you know, private kind of place. But as soon as you publish something, as soon as you got it out on the street, the, 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 there was trouble. And, and so they raised, they raised the issue of authority just by doing what they did and continuing to do what they did in terms of writing and speaking um, publicly. Um, The 13th century marked an increase in women writing. So it's, the 13th century is a bit of a watershed in terms of more numbers. And I feel bad that we probably have lost so much of what women wrote, but I'm also very glad about how much we do have that they wrote. And um, people now, since feminism, have done such a wonderful service in terms of shining the spotlight on women. So scholars are combing monastery archives and libraries and basements constantly now. And so that's where these manuscripts are that were written by women. Sometimes many women in a given convent would have written. So I think eventually we'll have a school of Teresa of Avila. So we'll have other people, maybe not as brilliant as she, but people who lived with her and wrote and, and would reflect a larger uh, cohort than just Teresa's thought. Um, the women are marvelously Weird, I, I, weird and wonderful. <laughs> and I give a talk, I've given a talk for 10 years called Medieval Women Mystics Weird and Wonderful, and because they, they are both. And I often describe them as, uh, in the Catholic, the Roman community, they're the crazy aunt and uncle. We all probably have stories of the crazy person in the family that everyone loves. Uh, they don't know much about them. Very few Catholics have read them, um, but they're all right. And you say, oh, oh yeah, those mystics in the closet. You know, we don't really know who they are. We don't understand them, but we don't want to let them go. We kind of like them in the family. We, they're, they're a little claim to fame. We can you know, fly the flag, flag every once in a while about these, these people. And so that creates, as any historical you know, figure, how do you go back and figure out what they're all about and decide what to bring forward and what not to bring forward? And I, um, 
I don't, I'm a big, huge fan of Francis McDormand. Are there others in the room who are Francis McDormand fans? Well, anyway, did you see Olive Kittredge? Her, uh, anyway, okay, so she bought the rights to Olive Kittredge, the novel, and produced a four-hour special on television in which she starred as Olive Kittredge. And um, I have to, I don't have time, but we don't have HBO, so I called Comcast and I said, I want to buy HBO for the month because I had to watch this Olive Kittredge. I mean, I, I would die without watching this show. <laughs> so they said, oh, that's fine. It costs $5. So I said, oh, great. So I said, just put that on my bill. So that I watched Olive Kittredge. And then the next day I called and canceled the HBO. And she said, oh, you didn't use up your whole month, so you'll, you get your $5 back. <laughs> so I was able to watch Olive Kittredge for free on HBO. <laughs> And it was a very, it's a very momentous, meaningful experience for me to watch this show, and I recommend it. I'm sure it's going to be around for a long, a long, long time. But um, Frances McDormand is a voice, a, a very important voice from the um, world of film um, for women. And when I read a couple of interviews about this show that she was going to do, she describes the female characters in literature as opposed to the female characters in film, and she's got a little edge on her shoulder for that, and that's fine, but there's a lot of truth to it in terms of how women are portrayed in film and, 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 and literature. So she says, women in literature are full and messy. They've got runny noses and burp and belch. This is how she describes Olive. Heaven, delicious, full feast, three course meal, soup, to nuts. And it caught me as she was describing women in literature. And Olive is a very difficult person. And she portrays her magnificently. And these women are like that. These medieval women are like that. I always say, you may like the mystics and make that you're glad that they're in the family, but you don't want to live with them. <laughs> it's, it's probably dangerous <laughs> to live with them. Um, and they, these women are full. They are, they are full of glory and <clears throat> brilliant intelligence and passionate love, absolutely fearless, courageous people, and that's another reason why they're important today in terms of the church. They, they have self-doubt. They're doing things that are so out of the mold. And they had hard lives. Catherine had a terrible, difficult death. I think at the end she said, well, first of all, she failed at everything that she tried to do. No, nothing really worked that she tried to do, as we see now. And I think she died wondering, did, did she follow God's will? Did she do, they do outrageous things. I, I try to think of something today that would be that outrageous for a woman to do that these women took on. And so they're to be admired in, in, in that sense. Um, so one reason that they're interesting and creative is that they didn't go to university. They weren't allowed to go to university. And it was the first time I realized what uni one thing that university education is. And it's good and bad. It gives you the grid. So you have hundreds of years of scholarship up to the time when you enter the university. And if you study chemistry, it's like, oh, here's the periodic table. This is, these are the questions we're asking. This is what we do in physics. This is what we do if we're studying Charles Dickens. This is what the critics, this is what the literature teaches us. And that's marvelous. But it also cuts you off. So you say, oh, oh, that's how we talk about Charles Dickens. And so I would never think that I might be able to talk about him in a different way if I, if I read him with my whole heart and soul and body. And what happened to these women is that they, they knew theology. They, you know, they, they knew Aquinas. They knew Augustine. It, they're, they're brilliant. In their text, you can just pull apart how much they knew about the theology they inherited. But they didn't get the grid. So they had books. They read. They had conversations. They knew educated clergy who did have the grid. So they had access to a lot of things that helped them do credible theology. But the wonderful thing about this is that they didn't have the grid, so what came in? Their life. So they talk theology out of their life in a way that's creative and original. They, they use metaphors. The first time you read them, you're like, what? <laughs> Catherine talks about the Trinity as the father, mother, first person is the table. And when I 
talk about this in audiences. I had, I had a man come up and he said, you know, I really like that metaphor, but not the table part for the father, you know, for, for the first person of the Trinity. The son obviously is the food, so it's a, it's a Eucharistic metaphor. And the Holy Spirit turns, about, turn, turns out to be the waiter, which reflects her life, as you may know, her parents wanted her to marry and settle down, and she said, no, God is calling me to this other life. And so she's from a family of 25 children, and they had cousins, and everybody that didn't have parents came in were part of their family. So they, you know, she became Cinderella in her house, because her parents thought, if we make her work and cook and serve and clean up, she'll get rid of this idea of sitting in a room and praying. So she uses that to talk about the Trinity. Um, Julian of Norwich is another person who has the most compelling theology. I think her theology of the Trinity is comparable to Augustine's. It's just very different, and it's, it's much more accessible in some ways than, than Augustine's. Um, so uh, so they're, they're, they, they use their life experience in, in ways that I think um, other male theologians in their period do not. And so I, I think they're valuable to us. Um, from that perspective. And then, oh, I have to quit. Um, just a couple of points about uh, going back to the, the, the homily today. Um, they all, there's a couple of things that come through screamingly from them that we can use. One is this open window. It's an open door about thinking freshly and creatively about theology. Another um, is their understanding, their theistic theologies, which we're very anthropocentric in our theology today. We're very interested in ourselves. And so, and it's a good starting point for some reasons. It's a bad starting point for some other reasons. But they're theistic. So their starting point is God. Their reference point is God screams at you. But in the midst of this, because of God, because of especially the incarnation, they see the, the main definition that I pull out of their anthropology is kapax dei, the capacity for God. And they, they really do blow me away. You cannot read them in a sustained way and not start standing up, up straight. Because she reminds you, all of them remind us that we are made to be God, basically. And even to begin to think about that, to, that we are made to be God. They were living it. And the other thing that I think comes across in their theology, also in Bonaventure and people like that, they're cheerleaders. They want you to see yourself totally as a capacious space for God. And they're cheering. They're cheering. They're, go, go, you can do this. They cajole. They criticize. They dump on you. They use every strategy in the book to get you to see the God that they have met and to become the desirous of union with God. And then the final thing is the bottom line of theology is love of neighbor. They, they're all ministering in the streets, most of them, even though women did, were not allowed ministries. And they were, this, especially the two Carmelites, talk about the loss that they, they wanted to you know, go. I mean, Therese wanted to be in Saigon where they had a house. And her, her health didn't allow that. But they so want to preach in a public way. Um, and they never forget. Teresa says, you'll never know whether you love God or not. How can you know if you love God or not? The only way is if you're loving your neighbor. So she said, forget about loving God. Love your neighbor. And if, you're, if the answer to that is yes, then the other piece is taken care of. You know you're, you're loving God. So over and over, the bottom line, neighbor, 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 neighbor. And they're off in these in incredible experiences of God. And they just come back, love your neighbor, love your neighbor, die for yourself, you know, die to yourself for the neighbor. So I think they're valuable. And their experience is experience as women. And we have almost none of that in theology in our tradition. So we need them desperately. Amen. <laughs> I think a questioner is allowed 45 seconds, so I don't get into a oh, lecture or anything I've oh, got in my life. I came to a lecture here at St. Thomas More from 45 minutes away where I had lived. And somebody said um, to the Bishop of Pittsburgh, who was giving the lecture, why isn't the church more hospitable to women? That's on a much more non-intellectual level than the area that you are talking about, I think. And he said, well, that's very simple. 
Until they seize the power, they won't have the power. What do you think of that? <laughs> yeah, I'm for it. <laughs> And I would, I would only add that um, the change will be so multifaceted. It will be like a, you know, like a diamond, like a prism with so many sides to it. And seizing it will be one of them. And there are, everybody has different gifts and talents in the community. And I'm so grateful for that because I have mine and you have yours and we, we need everybody to, to, to uh, travel this road, which is a very difficult, painful road. Um, and those of us who are a little, little older in this church can, you know, <clears throat> regale you all night with all the blood on the floor <laughs> uh, that we have as women theologians in the church. It's, it's not a pleasant story in many ways. So um, I think it's going to be bigger than that, but I would uh, definitely affirm. I don't know if I can handle that. <laughs> what can I say? Yes. Do you see that um, this uh, body of work of the, of the women doctors of the church is it becoming more common in the curriculum uh, in religious studies or in Catholic colleges or in uh, where, where is it becoming more common to have it be part of the curriculum? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, not many places. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you, you know, when you have individual scholars like myself, so when I'm somewhere, I do it. When Janet is somewhere, she does it. You know, so it happens where there are, you know, people studying them. But in terms of, um, you know, mainlining, uh, it, it's, it's, I think it's, a, it's still a very much of an uphill battle. I mean, I was at a seminary for 15 years and was never able to get spirituality into the core curriculum, even spirituality in the core curriculum, much less, you know, women. So. Um, and I think, like Ellen Cherry and some uh, authors, you know, I use her quote, it, it, she, she's to the point where you say, if you don't know this literature and, this is, and you're a scholar in this field, you're, you're not a good scholar. Mm -hmm. that, that you, you know, there's an obligation now because there's such a body of work um, to, 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 to learn about it, just to be reputable, just to be, to be you know, to cover your bases, to cover the field. Um, so it's... Uh, and partly they're difficult of access, you know, like, and that's why I spent a few minutes on the, on the distinctions and how theology and spirituality got separated, because mysticism is not really seen as a first, spirituality is not seen as a first class citizen in, in most theological communities now. Um, so we have a lot of work to, to, to do to get them, you know, get them back together, whether we still have the distinctions or if at some point in the long term future, we have a theology that's alive with the spirit in a way that is more inclusive of the, covering the bases that now spirituality covers. Yeah, because theology, I mean, people, I say, you know, th these women invite us to be theologians. And, and I, you know, I've written a book in the series on cult holiness of, gra I call it grassroots theology. They really, they can be theology, theologians. It, it, you finish thinking, wow, maybe I can, you know, that, that being a theologian in this broader sense is, is, is a responsibility and a right of baptism. It does not require vows, it does not require ordination, it does not require advanced degrees, and we all must step up to the plate. And we can say that because in this country we are so educated, you know, economics, psychology, child rearing, you, you name it, and we know all about it. And um, theology has to be that way for the, you know, for the faith community. So I think they do say to us, you too, be a, the be a theologian. Yeah. Yes. Can you explain whether there's a theology of service that is um, burned out so that um, in particular orders or just in my general, there's something well, in a way, that my, my point about the neighbor for all of these women, I mean, I think that's a strain that is everywhere. And um, like liberation theology in the 20th century, you know, th those kinds of, and, 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 and women, feminist theology, where um, service to the world and making the world a better place is, has to be an integral part of theology. So yes, I think it is there. I don't think we, we can stop lifting it up that we have to continue to lift it up in different and creative ways. But these women, 
definitely you, you come away if you're looking. Yeah. I mean, you know, one thing to do, and I hope that that my book encourages people to go back and read them. But there, I always say, you know, some people just love reading them. Uh, artists love Hildegard, um, and I find Hildegard very difficult. I mean, I fought with Hildegard for five years before I wrote about her. She she is a difficult intellectual creative genius and um, not easy. The keys, she doesn't give you the key and say, oh, okay, come on in, at least for me. Um, so I think if you read the primary sources and if you have some help, and that's why secondary literature or a lecture or some, a teacher can help you bridge this craziness that you, that you confront when you see them. But if you read their work and just the word neighbor just circle the, t the word neighbor every time it appears in any text, and you'll, it, and you'll see that, that the thread will then e emerge for you of a theology of service. Yeah. Do you think Pope Francis um, welcomes what you are saying? I know, I never asked him. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, he's certainly open. I think he is. You know, he's certainly an open person. On the women's issue, I, I'm, I'm not sure where, you know, it's a big issue, it's a big issue in the church. Well, time will tell. So I really appreciate your perspective on the, the exclusion of the women from universities sort of being an asset to their theology. What are some of the disadvantages to them being excluded from university, other than not having that, that grid trait, that training? Well, they were excluded from everything university meant. Um, and some of what university meant, maybe it was good they were excluded, you know, power, prestige, money, and, and men had access to all that. Influence would be a positive thing that they didn't have. You, you know, so if you, if you, have, a, if you have a platform, you have, you have influence, you can, you know, if you can reach a big audience, and they were deprived of that. So. Um, and just their calling. I think they, many of them were called to be considered full-fledged, top-flight theologians with all that went with that. So it's a, it was a lot, but it wasn't a total loss. You know, so they, they compensated for it in many ways. But it would, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's that, that same question, because you're black, because you're yellow, because you have a certain body anatomy, you can't be who you are. You, 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 that's just tragic. And I think that applies to these women. It's like, no, you can't come here because you're female. So we've got to, this goes Could back to the, the idea of personhood that we talked about, that we're all people. Yes? Um, what role do you, do you find that uh, Catholic uh, queens who ruled uh, in Europe, what role did they have in the development of women within the church, and did we see any changes within their kingdoms that uh, benefited women? So names, you know, Isabella Castile, Maria Teresa, right. um, Blood Mary. Marguerite Navarre, yeah. Yeah, um, well, they're the only other group that had um, and I didn't say this, but you know, most of the people that we read their books, they, they were wealthy from, from affluent families. That they had opportunities in, in terms of class and, and, and money. And so the only other group that we have a lot of written evidence from are the queens and the, and the princesses who had um, family education and power and time. <clears throat> and the monastic life also allowed for time. Um, so I think they, they definitely did. Um, I think their involvement with the church, I mean, the church was everything in the Middle Ages, so there wasn't a lot of separation between civic or um, aristocratic or monarch and, and, and the church. Um, but they, um, you know, we have evidence of, of them influencing their families and influencing politics where they, they were able to do that for the good, and some of them for the bad. You know, the, the, they're a mixed bag of people just like everybody else. Um, we know, too, that they, they um, made great contributions to the arts, and that included, you know, most art was religious art in the period. So people with money in, in convents and in castles were able to support um, the Books of Hours, for example, that women purchased. So that's a, <clears throat> a force in society where you're dictating, I want three paintings for my convent and I want these three saints, and the women ordering Books of Hours. So you're influencing the financial 
turnaround of money by, by buying things and ordering certain kinds of things so then those things surfaced. So there are lots of levels that, I, that, that, that um, both royal women and religious women um, influence society. Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all so much. It was a great audience. Thank you.